The January Autism Sales Event is here. We just got in our new 2024 inventory and we're running out of room, so we're slashing our 2023 prices to the lowest level they've ever been. You don't want to miss out on this deal, so hurry up and subscribe now before it's too late. If you miss out on this event, your wife will divorce you, your dog will run away, and your truck will break down. So come on down to visit our showroom today. Unless, of course, you already have autism, in which case you just rolled your eyes at all of this because commercials don't work on you. A recent study shows that people with autism are less likely to be influenced by the psychology of marketing strategies, but I think commercials can generally be problematic for us overall for a myriad of reasons. In this video, we're going to get into the research on all of it, but first, let's take a journey into my own hate-hate relationship with commercials. My whole life, I have found commercials to be so grating that I would oftentimes dive for the remote to mute the TV or panic to change the radio station whenever they came on. First, let's look at the sensory issues they cause. Commercials are infuriating sensory assaults to my ears, which is likely more upsetting to me than it would be to a neurotypical person. No one likes commercials. I've never seen anyone mute the program they're listening to, then let up with a smile when the advertisements come on. But it's a different ball game for those of us with sensory issues that leads to real life distress and anxiety. The jingles, the voices, and the sound effects are annoying as hell, and the volume level has always been unbearable. The fact that commercials were so much louder than the programming whenever they came on was actually addressed by the FCC here in America. They put a law in place that required commercials appearing on cable television to have the same average volume as the programs they accompany. However, this was back in 2013. So why do they all still sound like a monster truck rally barging into the middle of a church service a whole decade later? Well, that's because having laws in place doesn't translate to enforcement in the real world. Many commercials on cable television today are still louder than the programs, but even though over 50,000 complaints have been filed online in the years since this rule was implemented, no one follows up on them or does anything about it. And since streaming television like Hulu or Disney Plus aren't beholden to the FCC like the cable companies are, they can get away with commercials being as loud as they want. But moving past the sensory aspect, I've also had an extreme aversion to commercials for their content. They've always felt like an overabundance of materialism, inflated claims, and brainwashing to me. I hated commercials for cars and jewelry in particular. I felt like I wanted to vomit each time I saw a Shinko commercial telling viewers that the way to show their mothers or wives that they love them is to give her jewelry made out of gold or diamonds. And I wonder if people are actually believing this. The way any human being shows another person that they love them is through feeling connected. And we feel connected through acts of kindness, being there for them during hard times smiling and laughing with them and spending time with them. But according to this commercial, they bestowed love upon their partner by taking money out of their pockets and buying them metal and rocks that we as human beings have assigned arbitrary, ridiculous values to. I mean, surely people understand the value of actions over things, right? Right? And the car commercials? I mean, first off, those also top the charts of annoying voiceovers and jingles, but I just don't understand the point of them. If I'm gonna buy a car, it's because I need one and will get one that I can afford that fits my needs. No one is buying a car solely on the fact that you told us the Honda Days winter event is upon us. And it's not just commercials that make my eyes twitch. It's advertising schemes in general. Here in America, we have a store called Kohl's where everything is always on sale. They have these little electronic price tags above all their clothing that shows this t-shirt was originally $38, but it's currently 60% off. So now it's only $23, which is just regular price. And I just find it unbelievable that people don't realize they fabricated stupid numbers for original prices so they could mark them down to get people to buy them at normal price and they think they're getting a deal, but they do. I've been in this store and have overheard people getting excited over these fake sales. To me, all advertising feels like 
the matrix and I took the red pill so I can see what's happening outside the illusion while everyone else is blissfully participating in it completely unaware. So not only do the sensory issues affect us negatively, but because our brains are wired so differently, there's evidence to back up the theory that the actual psychology of advertisements likely don't work on us. An article in Psychology Today had this to say about it. A new study has found that people with autism spectrum disorder may be impervious to misleading marketing compared to the rest of us. Rather than a disability, having ASD in this case might actually be a strength. With their greater focus to detail, people with autism are better able to tune out irrelevant context such as advertisements. The study they're referring to was published in a journal of the Association for Psychological Science. Let's learn something! In this study, the researchers used 10 product pairs which differed on two dimensions and a third decoy item, and the result indicated that individuals with ASD are less susceptible to the effects of decoy options when evaluating and choosing the best product among several options relative to individuals without ASD. For example, participants were asked to choose from one of three USB devices that varied according to their capacity and their lifespan. With purely rational economic decision making, the decoy items would be irrelevant and participants would make the same choice both times when products A and B were shown. If the decoys were effective, however, participants would switch their selection when the decoy changed. The data revealed that compared with neurotypical participants, those with ASD made more consistent choices and made fewer switches in their selections. I think this all makes sense if you think about it. Companies pay millions in research to figure out what will influence our buying decisions, and these days the science behind this feels invasive and creepy. They research timing colors, images, sounds, and buzzwords. They examine trending behaviors amongst various demographics, and they calculate physical responses that correlate like adrenal responses, endorphins, fear, or other emotions. Advertisers use a combination of cognitive and social psychology to influence us to persuade us to buy their products or services, but if our brains are wired differently than the masses, these psychological tactics may not influence us the same way. And here's just one example of this difference. A study from Caltech examined how people with ASD interpret visual input. They showed participants 700 images and tracked their eye movements. The result of this study showed that people with ASD are less drawn to faces than people without ASD. It also demonstrated that people with ASD were strongly attracted to the center of images, regardless of the content. The findings of that study were so promising that it might have strong uses as a diagnostic tool in the future. And I can personally vouch for this being true. Item number 6,537 of things I did before my diagnosis that makes sense now. But I remember a specific time of looking at a picture someone took of my family in front of a large stone sign. When I was examining it, my husband pointed out what one of our faces was doing, but I hadn't even noticed. I was looking at every detail except what our faces were doing. I was looking at the positions and distributions of the objects in the photo, the color of the sign, the font of the lettering, the fact that some lady's hair blowing in the wind was caught on the edge of the picture, and the shapes of the clouds. I was in full private eye evidence gathering mode and my husband was like, I was scrunching my face in this photo. So if you think about even just this one simple area where our brains operate differently, you could see how it could be possible that the marketing on visual images may fall flat on neurodivergent people, not just from an anecdotal standpoint, but on a factual scientific level. Basically, when you tailor your marketing strategies around typical psychological responses, us autistics are over here like, ah! catch me if you can. Now, with all of that said, I feel like PDA might play a role in our impervious nature to commercials as well, because don't tell me what I should purchase. For those of you who don't know, PDA is somewhat of a controversial topic related to autism that stands for pathological demand avoidance, but some suggest personal drive for autonomy might be a better fit for the acronym. It's a pretty loaded subject that 
probably needs its own video. So to keep things short, it is often described as a profile of autism that causes the individual to resist or ignore anything they perceive as a demand or an expectation. As of right now, it's not recognized in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and some people think it just flat out doesn't exist or is a made up term. Others recognize that there is a pattern of personal drive for autonomy that exists among autistic people, but that the inference of that term itself is problematic for autism acceptance or a misunderstood categorization of this behavior. I'm not here to make a declaration on the validity of this term, but I do think there's room to include it in this discussion. Personally, when I first heard about this term, my intuition said it was bullocks, but I've been thinking about it a lot more lately and have begun to realize that I do have traits of this that up until now I had classified as being contrarian. I've seemingly found myself on the opposite end of society on a lot of issues. If something becomes trendy or popular among the masses, chances are I won't want anything to do with it. If being a suck up to the boss at work was a way to get ahead, I would ignore them. And I have literally sat in crowds of people where everyone is being told to throw their hands up or to follow certain dance moves and I will be the only one refusing to do it. So in this way, if a commercial is telling us to buy a service or product, I have this overwhelming feeling of wanting to refuse to buy that product or service because you told me to. So as you can see, there's a lot at play here regarding why commercials may not work on us as autistics. We might avoid them because of grading audio issues issues. We tend to have purely rational economic decision making because we're not as easily persuaded by the psychological tactics of packaging, product placement, or emotions. And there could be some element of personal drive for autonomy that might make us opposed to such attempted persuasions. But whatever the case may be, I think we should be proud of yet another benefit of being neurodivergent that continuously chips away at that deficits only model. But seriously folks, this 50% off sale for my subscribe button won't last long, so don't miss out on this opportunity. Hit that subscribe button below now to take advantage of this great deal. Did you click on it? I'm, I'm not leaving until you click on it. All right, I'm leaving, but only because I have other stuff to do. Okay, bye. Mwah.